So today we're going to be talking about our multidisciplinary care for patients with pituitary tumors. Before we begin, we're just going to let everybody know that we're all in the confines of our own offices and therefore we're not wearing masks. Um, but I'll start with Dr. Rao, can you introduce yourself? My name is Sarika Rao. I'm an endocrinologist here at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I'm very much interested in treating uh, endocrine cancers and different tumors. And uh, so the pituitary space is very much up my alley. So very proud to be here with my colleagues. Great. Dr. Olamu? Hi, I'm Dr. Olamu. I'm one of the ENOs and throat surgeons here with a specialty in rhinology. Um, I enjoy, of course, treating uh, diseases of the, of the nose, um, anything from inflammatory to nasal obstruction, and I have a special interest in transnasal approaches to uh, um, tumors and masses in the cell base. Dr. Donaldson? Hi, I'm Angela Donaldson. I'm also one of the rhinologists and the anterior skull based surgeons here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. I enjoy inflammatory disease such as polyps and nasal obstruction, but one of my true passions is skull based surgery. I love working with neurosurgeons and creating a team approach to take care of patients. And I'm Kai Sanchez Chana. I'm in the Department of Neurosurgery and I specialize in brain tumor care. I especially like treating patients with pituitary tumors because we can change the natural history of these tumors and make patients' lives a lot better. Um, so with pituitary tumors, Dr. Rao, can you tell us about the pituitary gland and what it does? So the pituitary gland, it, it sits at the base of the brain, kind of, I always point here, it's kind of behind your eyes a little bit um, below where the, the nerve sits that helps us see. And um, it, we call it the master gland of the endocrine system, uh, which means that it makes different hormones that control other glands in the body. So for example, you know, we all know we have a thyroid gland, it's a butterfly-shaped butterfly gland at the base of the neck, and there's a hormone made in the pituitary that helps regulate that. Um, we also make hormones that, from the pituitary that regulate the, uh, the adrenal glands, um, helps with bone and um, bone growth, and um, also hormones that help a woman to breastfeed, essentially, and uh, helps control the sodium and uh, or the salt and water concentration in our body. So a lot of different things. That's kind of a general overview of what the gland does, although it's very tiny, but it's a powerful gland. And Dr. Rao, can you tell us about pituitary tumors and the different types of pituitary tumors one can have? So pituitary tumors are quite common, actually, of the endocrine system. Most of the glands are all prone to lumps and bumps, as I like to say, and so the pituitary is no exception. Um, most of the tumors are all benign, but um, some of them make hormone and some of them are just kind of an enlargement of the gland. And so when we, whenever we see an enlargement, um, you know, by accident on an MRI or a CT, then we typically like to make sure that uh, we check the hormone levels to make sure that there isn't an overproduction of one of these hormones that I just mentioned. Um, and looking at patient symptoms, of course. Um, but many of the cases, these enlargements don't make any hormone at all. And so, you know, then we need to decide whether something needs to be done about it or not. Great. So with surgery, we don't always have to operate on patients with pituitary tumors. Most of the time, actually, we just watch these tumors. And what I mean by watching is once it's diagnosed with some type of imaging, we watch them with serial imaging, which is an MRI scan or a CAT scan. And we change the interval depending on how fast we think it's growing or how slow it's growing. The slower growing tumors, we, span, we space out the imaging. For faster growing tumors that we're worried about, we decrease the interval between imaging. We typically only do surgery um, at the help with en endocrinology if for tumors that are producing hormones that can't be treated medically. Um, those are like your Cushing's tumors, which produce steroids or cortisols, your growth hormone producing tumors, which cause symptoms of acromegaly, and sometimes even for lack of producing tumors, but those are usually treated medically. For the other types of tumors that don't produce hormones, we do surgery when they're growing on these serial imaging or if they're pressing on critical structures like the eye nerves that control your peripheral fields or in the cavernous sinus where they're causing symptoms of cranial nerve deficits, um, such as double vision or eye movement problems or facial asymmetry um, from eyelid problems from the tumor. So for the most part, we watch these tumors unless they're pressing on um, critical structures or they're producing hormones uh, that can't be treated medically. 
We can treat these tumors in different ways. We can get to the pituitary gland uh, through a craniotomy, which is an open approach to the skull. We can also go through the nose and we can also go through the lip or underneath the lip. Um, we typically prefer, uh, prefer going through the nose, but Dr. Donaldson, can you tell us about that approach? Sure. So again, traditionally, we started off by doing this with an open approach. And some of the limitations to that is that you actually have to retract the brain. When we went through the lip, it was better cosmesis, but we got to the nose in a longer fashion and patients tend to be in the hospital longer. When we started doing sinus surgery that included an endoscope, which is a scope that goes through your nose, we actually found we could see better. So we've actually used a lot of these endonasal, as we call it, or through the nose procedures because it gives us better visualization, there's less nose bleeds, and typically patients get to go home quicker. We've also found that sometimes some of the complications from that surgery using other approaches are less likely. Patients, I tell them, it's the same nose that you go into the hospital with that you leave, and you don't get the empathy that most people get from having a brain surgery since it only comes out through your nose. Yeah, most people don't realize they've had surgery, or other people don't realize they've had surgery. But Dr. Olin, can you tell us about the approach during the surgical case? Of course, um, as Dr. Donaldson said, um, there is, can you hear me? Okay. As Dr. Donaldson said, um, it's much easier to go through the nose than to go through a craniotomy approach. I have a model here I'm gonna use to sort of illustrate things a little bit. Going through the nose, you would notice that instead of going through the brain where you have to go through a lot of tissue, Going through the nose with an endoscope, it's mostly empty space getting through the nose. So you go through the nasal airway, you can gently move aside some of the tissues of the nose to get through the sphenoid sinus. Now as sinus surgeons, this is a, an area we're very comfortable with. It's a region we operate in all the time. So we can um, easily navigate this region, open up the sinus, Again, we get into empty space there within the sinus, and then we're right at the pituitary gland, similar to what um, um, Dr. Rao talked about. It's right in the middle of the head at the skull base. And at this point, it's um, the easiest way to um, get to the gland. And using the endoscope, we have great visualization. We can actually see everything in very high detail on a um, big um, screen. And that allows us to be very precise and very um, um, accurate in removing exactly what we need to. Once um, in combination with um, neurosurgery, we are done with the resection. Um, the rhinologist will then reconstruct this barrier between the um, gland and the sinus to once again create a watertight barrier between the brain and the nose. And we'll also leave the sinus in a healthy fashion such that it drains normally um, after the surgery. So yeah, so once you guys get us to the pituitary gland area, we work in combination with each other. We actually have four hands through your two nostrils, but we minimize any uh, manipulation of your structure. So we don't have to touch any of the brain structures, minimize any of the nose structures we have to touch. So it's truly minimally invasive. Once we get to the, uh, the pituitary gland, we have a specialized drill that thins the bone overlying the pituitary gland and we remove a very small area of the bone to access the gland area. We have a lining of the brain that we cut and open into to enter the pituitary tumor and we use navigation, which is like a GPS system to help us identify uh, where the tumor is and we look at the visualization through the scope to identify where the gland is and we try to remove the tumor as much as we can safely without endangering the gland or surrounding structures, which include the carotid artery and the optic nerves. We have specialized dissectors that help us separate the tumor from the surrounding gland, as well as uh, specialized aspirators or suckers that help morselize the tumor. Um, but this way, we can minimize any manipulation of the surrounding structures and try to get patients as home as quickly as possible. Typically, after the surgery, we admit the patient to the floor, and that's when we rely on our endocrinology colleagues um, to help us with the management. Dr. Rao, can you tell uh, our patients what we look for postoperatively? So we're looking for, you know, a couple things, um, kind of going back to the hormonal part that I was mentioning earlier. Two more critical things, especially in the post-op setting that we check for is how is a person's salt and 
water concentration um, because that's one of the hormones that's in the back part of the pituitary that sometimes can be affected post-op, but not so often, uh, but sometimes. So we check the salt levels pretty closely and uh, watch a patient's uh, urine output as well. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is um, there's the adrenal glands that, you know, are glands that sit above the kidneys. And I mentioned that there's a hormone from the pituitary that helps regulate the adrenal glands and um, essentially, you know, the steroids that our body produces. And so we, we like to make sure that a person um, after one of these surgeries is producing enough hormone and typically they are. But it's one of the those. That's one of the two other tests that we we check immediately post op, and then um, typically we'll see the patient back in our clinic in about a month or so and kind of check all the other hormones um, that are you know secreted from the pituitary gland and make sure that there is no deficiency. Um, and also, you know, depending on what the patient went in for surgery for, if there was an overproduction of hormone, then we can also see if there's what we call biochemical remission, where, um, you know, because we debulked the tumor, our surgeons debulked the tumor or removed it, have the hormonal issues, the excess hormone previously, has it resolved now and is it normal? So those are a couple things that we do. And, um, you know, we work with our neurosurgery colleagues um, together and kind of determine the interval of imaging um, for the follow-up perspective. And um, if a patient doesn't have symptoms or structurally, if you know the tumor has resolved, then um, we may not need to keep checking the hormonal levels each time, maybe you know, again in a few months afterwards, but um, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Great, and then Dr. Donaldson, most patients go home the next day or the following day, but can you tell us what to look for? What we look for from the surgical side and what the patients can look for from the surgical side after surgery? Sure. So after surgery, we want to make sure that the patient doesn't have to deal with any postoperative nose bleeds. So there is a packing that goes into the nose overnight and then it's pulled out the next morning before you go home. This allows us to allow the patient to just recover from their surgery and not have to worry about any nose bleeds. Afterwards, they're breathing well, and we have them use a saline spray. It kind of looks like one of the over-the-counter nasal steroid sprays, and we have them do that for about two weeks until they're seen back in the clinic for further evaluation. That helps them stay clean and hopefully breathe better. So from the neurosurgery side, we usually see the patients two weeks after surgery, and then if everything goes well, we either see them three or six months later, and depending on what the tumor is and if it's producing hormones, we follow them either at a year interval, but we continue to follow everybody for the rest of their lives. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team, as you can see, involved in everybody's care. Um, but is there anything else anyone would like to add? Uh, for rhinology, the post-op involves, um, first, we see the patient in about two weeks, and we take a look inside the nose with a camera to make sure everything is healing appropriately. Um, make sure there are no signs of um, infection or any other problems, which are extremely rare after these surgeries. If there are excess um, blood clots or nasal crusting, we'll also um, clean that out, which will um, speed up the healing process. After the first visit, we usually have the patient um, start some nasal saline um, irrigations to help clean out um, the nose and sinuses as well and help things stay um, healthy while it's healing. We typically see the patients um, two weeks after surgery, about a month after that, and then about two months after um, that visit. Um, by the third visit, um, the um, nose and sinuses are fully healed. 